Hello. Welcome to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. My name is Eric Herlock, and I am on the road still. Today is July 19th. I am here in the RV. We are camped somewhere in Northern California, not too far from the coast. It's been an incredible journey getting here. Uh, Last show I published was my interview with Wendy Mosher from New West Genetics. And uh, the day after I was in Fort Collins, we drove down to Monte Vista, Colorado. Beautiful drive down along the front range of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, down into the San Luis Valley, where we stopped in at Formation Ag, and we caught up with Corbett Hefner and Randy Wright. I sat down with them in the you know sort of the front room at their their shop there in Monta Vista, and today's show is going to be that conversation. So stick around for that. Uh, but I will sort of bring you up to speed on, on the trip so far. Uh, but first, I do want to mention our sponsors. I want to give a shout out to King's Agri Seeds this week. Thank you for your support. Um, and of course, um, I would also like to just thank our, our whole, whole crew of sponsors. Everybody from IND Hemp in Montana, New Holland Agriculture, the National Hemp Association, DeSmet Rose Downs, Amerishon Cast Hemp, King's Agri Seeds, Pterodon Hemp, and Victory Hemp Foods, and of course, King's Agri Seeds. So thank you all for your support. Couldn't be doing this without you. Right, so last week we were in Fort Collins, Colorado, and then we drove down the Front Range, down to the San Luis Valley in Southern Colorado, to the town of Monta Vista which got its name because uh, you, apparently you can see mountains on all sides of the town. But when I was there, it was so smoky and hazy from the fires that you couldn't see any mountains. But um, we went to Formation Ag. We were at their shop. Um, and what a great crew of people down there. Um, they were very warm and welcoming. And uh, they even helped us change the oil in the RV. I went across the street to the Napa parts place and I got you know the filter and uh, the oil and we took it into the shop at Formation Ag and uh, those guys changed the oil in the RV so that was amazing that's above and beyond um, but yeah then uh, Corbett gave me a tour of the of the shop I saw the decorticator in action you know the decorticator 660 that they make and holy cow, you know, like big round bales of hemp going in and then it's sort of separating it and then the uh, the herd goes up one track and the fiber goes the other way. It was fantastic. I shot a bunch of video, so um, you'll be able to see that on the show page for this episode. Um, so check that out. So yeah, let's jump into this interview with Corbett Hefner and Randy Wright from Formation Ag. And then after the interview, I'll bring you up to speed on what's happening on the tour. Here we go. Corbett Hefner and Randy Wright, welcome to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. How are you guys doing? Thanks for having us. Great. Thanks. Hello. Thanks for having me out here to the shop here in uh, Monta Vista, Colorado. It was a pretty fun drive coming down from Boulder this morning. It's like sweeping vistas everywhere. Except for the smoke. Yeah, I guess it would have been a lot nicer without the smoke, but you've got some yeah, fires here. Are, yeah, we're getting smoke blown in from several of the fires that are in other states. Just kind of pools right here. This is a very large agricultural valley, and just how it happens, it kind of just swirls in here. Yeah. So, so would I be seeing mountains out these <clears throat> windows if it wasn't so hazy? 365 degrees. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Very large. Mount Blank is over this direction. The San Juans are over this direction. Um you know, the collegiate range you drove. Right, we drove through I don't that. even know if you got to see them when you came down because of the smoke. That's yeah, we the, did see some pretty big peaks. That's yeah. them. Okay. So you drove really beautiful part of the state. Yeah. And this is this is a very interesting part of the state of Colorado. It's much different than the front range in the ski area uh, part of Colorado. Right. So um, why don't you introduce yourself? Well, sure. I'm Corbett Hefner, uh, Formation Ag, and uh, we build hemp harvesting, processing, grain cleaning equipment since, well, we really started the end of 2015, 
2016, mid 2016, I came on board and have been engineering and innovating equipment ever since. Okay. So. And Randy? I'm Randy, a general manager, sales manager, those kinds of things for Formation Ag. I've been here since January 2nd of 2019. Um, just kind of basically in a startup, you do everything there is to do, and we've done it all between Corbett and I. There isn't anything we haven't done in this mm. startup business, including cleaning the restrooms, huh, Corbett? Yep. Whatever you got to do. Right. This was an abandoned building when we, we took it over uh, that January 2nd. It was 25 below zero, and there was no heat no, no. in here, and the roof had been ripped off in parts, and so we slowly pieced it back together. Cool. We, uh, separated from Power Zone Agriculture. Not separated, that's the wrong word. We, we rebranded because we ran out of room at the Power Zone Ag Shop uh, to where we were building pumps and then the hemp equipment, so we decided to move down here. All right, well, you guys uh, Formation Ag are playing a c critical role in the development of the hemp industry um, by producing processing equipment because that seems to be the, b the bottleneck in the whole fiber and grain uh, system. So. We, when, they, when, we, when Power Zone, when we started in 2015, they looked at the industry overall and said, okay, uh, what, what are some of the bottlenecks? What are the things we see opportunities that we can use our fabrication staff and our engineering staff and, and help provide solutions? You know, we're in a very large agricultural area. Uh, water consumption is a big deal here, and it just seemed like a decent fit. So the first bottleneck they really identified was decortication. I mean, you could see that getting into downstream finished good products required this piece of equipment. Everything, you know, the 25,000 uses for the hemp, a huge portion of those start uh, with decorticated products. So it was kind of a necessary evil, if you will. So we decided, yeah, we have to build something like that. And then the, the second thing we built was our first attempt at, at harvesting. We built the first uh, grasshopper chaff collection cart to go behind the combine, which we found out quickly for CBD that was actually the wrong way to harvest it uh, because it degraded the oil uh, content so bad going through the threshing mechanism of a combine. Um, you know, all our third-party test results showed major degradation, so we came up with the clean cut uh, harvester and the clean strip harvester. So one of them harvests whole plants, the other one harvests uh, just the buds. Okay. And are you, are you selling a lot of those now, or have you seen a, a decline in the, oh, the yeah. CBD? Oh, yeah, major decline is, is the acreage went down, the demand for those machines went down. We still sell a few here and there uh, for people that are still going or have increased their business. Uh, you know, but unfortunately, just like everybody else, that downturn in CBD has really been a, right. a negative in terms of, of harvesting equipment. But fortunately, we would always have always been working on research and development for the long-line fibers. Um, like I said, when I came in in 2016, I came out of flexible packaging. So we made um, knit products, non-woven products. I, I converted a lot of woven and non-woven products and just understand the dynamics of what it took to make a, f a filament that would allow you at some point in time to make a, a finished good. So we'd always been working on that, and it was kind of, I mean, there was a point in time, if you look at our data history on our search results, it was a 180-degree inversion from harvesting to, to fiber processing. I mean, two a day almost. Wow. And thank goodness we'd always been working on that. And then we also have uh, grain cleaning equipment, sizing, equipment um, from small scale to large scale color sorting equipment things of those natures so and, and not just hemp they do grass seed to sunflower seeds to barley to wheat no oh, okay. matter what right <clears throat> so those are the things that have kept this kept us functional during this 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 pandemic and the downturn in the right. cbd market so we hope that comes back because we've got more harvesters to build we're designing more uh right now we've got a we're still in the drawing stage but I think we've got a, a major solution for this hemp grain and fiber harvesting issue where we can make this run on a combine or on a, any other power unit and, and solve this issue of, of one pass harvesting, but not having a dedicated machine for harvesting. Hmm. I don't care for that kind of paradigm where you have a machine, you run it for a few weeks and it sits for the rest of the year. It doesn't sit well with me, so we're trying to divide devise implements to go on a machine and off a machine okay. so it's not a dedicated piece of equipment so right, right. that that'll be in the field this year yet cool 
Um, the decorticator that I saw back mm -hmm. there, um, can you explain how that <coughs> works? Sure. It's again, uh, our goals are long line fiber. So to me, long line is anything over three inches, which is really hard to get to, but we're making very, very long fibers that are high in tensile strength so that they'll perform ultimately in these downsteam processes. You know, every one of the refinement steps takes a little bit more of the length out of it. So by starting really long, then you get some, some really unique properties. But it starts with hemp grown for a purpose. So it's been planted at tighter spacing. Now we're trying to keep the stalks in between a quarter and three eighths of an inch for more cordage fiber textile kind of stuff. If you want more hemp creed or more animal bedding, maybe you go a little lesser in population because we do see the crops that were grown at different densities decorticate differently in terms of what is the size of the finished herd and, and the fibers. I don't see much difference personally, but <clears throat> there's a little bit there. So to get that to work, we had to engineer a piece of machinery that would unroll that bale, not compromise the tensile strength of the fibers, and feed it into all the downstream machines in a consistent speed and a consistent volume. Because that's, that's the key to optimizing any piece of machinery, is to feed something in continually at a, at a certain rate. And then you can do a lot of work with it. So we, we engineered this piece of machinery to do this, just, just that, and it's functioning really, really nice. So we're quite happy with it. Um, got dust control on it and, and some neat features. Then it goes into the 660, and in your video that you saw it out there, that is a production bale and wine. We call it the in-feed system and a production 660. The 660 is a roller breaker style machine, which is what lets us get to those long fibers. Uh, and there's some things we do with technology in there to, to help that along. <clears throat> the next piece of machinery in that system is, is we call it a shaker table. I'm sure there's a better name, but it's literally shaking out herd that's been entangled in the fiber uh, that's coming out of the decorticator and we shake most of that out that herd drops down and goes to the fiber or the herd path where we we break out some of the residual fibers that are left in there and then that herd once it's been cleaned to the fibers goes downstream a little bit more and then we can size it into three different categories and we can change that uh, sizing profile depending on what people need so you know a customer buys the machine they have the option of changing the sizing on the herd uh, depending on how much vacuum you pull on the, the system, you can change the dust content. Uh, we try to capture the dust as best as possible uh, in this machine, you know, because we're not a dedicated processing facility. We don't capture all of it uh, just because it's, you know, this is all self-funded research. So we just mm -hmm. have been very cash conscious as of late, so we haven't spent that. But we catch we can catch the dust. You know, we for round numbers, we say between eight and quarter of an inch is, is the small size. For the most part, we've been running between half an inch and a half for, for hemp creep, but it's kind of that size profile is shifting down a little bit for people. And then any of the oversized product, inch and a half north, at the moment we're converting that down into half inch pieces for hemp creep people that, that want uh, something that's more optimized for these hemp installation blow gun machines. Okay. So that's the herd process. The fiber takes another path where we segregate the longer fiber, clean that up as best as we possibly can. And and then at the moment, we're just collecting that in totes or bales. Uh, bales is ultimately what it'll be in the next few weeks. We'll have a baler in here so we can make it into modules so that we can ship it because we've got to break down some fiber that's going to get exported. Okay. <clears throat> so those are all things that we keep uh, working on and keep progressing with and keep buying machinery and modifying and changing depending on what the needy of the industry is. I mean, one important thing and the reason we've designed this machine modularly is because we don't know what the ultimate direction, if there is an ultimate direction. So we've made it as flexible as possible and as flexible as possible in the terms of finished goods. Because we can always cut something down, but you can't ever make it longer. So right. we're trying to make longer fibers in giving people a platform that they can convert it into something they need. So, you know, the long line fiber, very flexible finished products, very flexible piece of machinery that, you know, if you don't need all these pieces, don't buy them. You know, if you only need two or three of the pieces, then that's what you get. And then if you need them later, we just add them on. So it should be a simple setup like that. Okay. Try to make it as easy as possible. For folks who are interested in, you know, purchasing uh, mm -hmm. a system like this, what do they need, like, facility-wise? Space or power? Like, talk about some of that. Uh, that machine only takes up 
footprint wise about 2,500 square feet. Okay. So it's quite small. Um, I'd probably put it in a 5,000 square foot room and then you're going to need roughly the same size just to keep your bales dry in, in stored work and process kind of stuff. Okay. Um, Cause moisture content's important. You don't want to run 25, 28, you know, 30% moisture content for a couple of reasons, but it, it's just too flexible. Um, but also remember this is an organic compound. If it's that moist, it has the opportunity to mold. Mm. And when it starts to mold, it will catch on fire at some point. So we kind of, we try to stay on the dryer in, yeah, right. you know, 10, 15, 18%. Then we seem to have very good success with it. Um, but everything starts with the genetics and how you farm the crop. That really helps uh, once you understand how you're going to farm it. And ultimately where you're going to take the crop is going to tell you how you're going to farm it. Okay. So that's very important. Right. Um, power considerations, is it three phase, single phase? Yeah, this, this is all, at the, we, we can make it either way. Oh, okay. 243 phase, 483 phase. And you're, well, we have a, uh, we work with, uh, um, <coughs> excuse me, Cannamill with machinery to get this down to 20 thousandths of an inch, 50 micron powder. So if you add that piece of machinery, you're in four and a quarter, 450 amps. Okay. Without that, you're about 200 and some change. Hmm. So right. it's not a lot. You know, simple. We like simple stuff. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. I mean, if you need to, we, we pick this machine up constantly, this system and move it in and out as we build machinery for customers. We install their machines here, have them come in and train them and teach them and work with them on it here uh, so they can get familiar with it before we tear it apart and take it to their shop and reinstall okay. it. Right. So it just seems, I think that's going to help with the uh, the learning curve because it is quite steep. So they bring in their products and, and we convert them for them and uh, just, just to get them familiar with the equipment while they're here. That right. way if there's something, then we can answer their questions. Um, can you talk about like how many <coughs> of these machines are out there now or where they are in the country? Well, we've got a lot of them out there, but uh, we've, we've got them everywhere from Russia, Canada. Uh, you know, we hope to get them in South America soon, as soon as we can get down there. But then the balance of them are in the U.S. right now. I okay. don't usually give out the final number, but... Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, when people talk about decortication, they often talk about hammer mills. This is not a hammer mill. This is the opposite of a hammer mill. Can you explain to <clears throat> me? Sure. The, 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 uh, the reason for not using a hammer mill, again, is, is focused on our long line. Every place a hammer impacts the fiber can be a damage to that fiber or a weakness in the tensile strength. I was showing you earlier, pulled out some of the long fibers and could show you the different types of breaks. Every place a blade or a hammer has hit that fiber, you can see where it's been sheared. It's cut, it breaks at 90 uh, degree angle. Everything that's a natural break fibrillates. And, and you can tell the difference, and you can tell the difference just pulling on it where it's been impacted and where it's not. So I mean, hammer mills, you're making half to maybe two inch pieces of fiber Maybe there's some out there to do longer. I don't know. But when a machine is spinning at an X, you know, 1,000 RPM, you just don't have an option but to impact those fibers at some place and, and create some sort of weakness. Now, it depends on what you're doing with the product. If that's a positive and a negative, does, you have to make that choice. Um, begin being tried to be flexible. We've, we've tried to give it the best chance for the highest tensile strength. Then you can convert it into what you need after the fact. Um, and, and as the market is emerging and still growing and we're still trying to figure that out, then we can choose different techniques. Uh, we, I didn't take you out and show you the Genesis machine. It's a little different technique, still makes long fibers, a little bit faster in certain terms of throughput, but it's going to make a little different profile. It's a little more open. The fibers are still very, very long, but it's just a different technique. Cool. And we'll still be working on that too when things keep rolling here. Right. Um, before the interview started, Rich and I were talking about uh, that you guys are pretty much the <coughs> only ones in the U.S. making anything like this, right? We're the only ones making this kind of a decorticator I know of. In the world? In the world, yeah. Okay. And we, like I said, we, we built the first one in the U.S. since uh, Slickton made his machine in 1905, 1907. Uh, I mean, it just kind of stopped. That, that, that progression stopped. So we've made a lot of progress in the five, six years since we've been building these whole lot of progress and we keep learning more every day okay. uh, when you're walking around there today we were trying something different sometimes they work sometimes they don't but by gosh we're trying different stuff all the time to keep helping move this industry forward we just see that as a necessary thing that just happens to happen right. and, and we just understand uh, some of the end needs of the product as, as best as we can and keep making steps towards uh, uh, supplying this this type of machinery to help the industry move forward 
because without it, it's going to stagnate again. Right. Um, would you say innovation is is uh, like the hallmark of Formation Ag? Oh yeah, we've we've built twenty some odd machines since we started huh. uh, in the industry for different needs. You know, we, we were a custom job shop at at, at Power Zone Agriculture, and you know we've kind of morphed into to models or systems that we can build multiple as of, but you know, if somebody's got a project, they say, hey, I'd like for a, a, a this kind of a thing. Always happy to talk to people because we don't know it all by any means. We're learning every day, but we, there's still, I'm sure something else, somebody's got another product they want to build with it. And you know, we're happy to take a look at those kind of things and see if it makes sense for everybody to do it. So they could come to you mm -hmm. with an idea and you could help them sort sure. of flesh that out. Yeah, okay. yeah, we're, we're, we're innovation and design company so at, at our heart we happen to be manufacturers and we made a lot of cbd harvesters to feed our r d habit is what i like to say <laughs> um, but, but it's true i mean we we lose a lot of that capital on on building decorticators and learning you know steps and techniques to keep uh, further in the the grain and fiber along because i mean the, the volume of acres of uh, that can be planted of fiber crops is far going to eclipse CBD. I mean, if you go look at it, like Julie Lerner did that white paper that said total demand for CBD in the U.S. is somewhere around 2,800 acres. That's all you need to plant. We've got a few more machines out there than that yeah. for harvesting. So, you know, to, to feed the automotive plants or, you know, some of these other projects that we've worked on, you're talking tens of thousands of acres, not thousands of acres. Then it starts to make a difference in the other commodity prices. You know, if we start pulling acres out of out of corn or wheat or cotton or whatever it is, then the supply and demand thing starts to work, and then maybe the prices of those commodities will come up. So we were talking earlier, if these if our family farmers are not healthy, uh, the whole country is not going to be very healthy very soon. We'll get hungry real quick. Yeah. So we really are concerned and. And try to keep that in our mind all the time when we're building machinery and how we price stuff is without healthy farms, none of this is, is, is viable. Randy, what's your role here in the, co in the company? Well, you know, like I said, in a, in a startup, everybody has roles that are, scan the, the entire uh, business. But uh, general manager and sales manager have been my two probably closest titles, okay. um, whether it be managing the whole plant or... Uh, working on the sales of the equipment. But even with that, you know, Corbett and I share a lot of those responsibilities across the board. And uh, as well as Dan, we brought Dan into a lot of the conversations that we have as well. So and we just all, it's its all just a big group of people that works together very well. Great. Um, talk about the plans for the future. Plans for the future. Well, innovation. Yeah. Corbett is our yeah, innovator and he's, he's too humble sometimes about the innovation that he uh, brings to the table, but uh, he's, he's got a lot of great ideas, and you talked about one of them, but what else, he, where else do we well, want to talk there's about? There's a bunch more stuff. You know, we, we do some product design work with another company we started uh, for people, and some of those things are just absolutely fascinating uh, to me, and just things we've leveraged on from packaging days and uh, using some of those ideas and techniques and in, into making finished products out of the the, the hemp, I was showing your wife a, a, a mat that I made out of the hemp fiber without lime in it that's fire retardant. Huh. So, and it's completely degradable. So that's really kind of a fun thing. But the harvester, the new harvester idea is, is I think, going to be transformational in the industry. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not color specific, so it'll go on to any piece of equipment. I'm really excited about that. Keep refining the the decorticating equipment. I'm drawing a blank. There's a few other ones that are probably some in the pipe. But possible yeah. innovations with hempcrete, things like that that we're working oh, yeah. on. Yeah, you know this technique in getting the herd down to those twenty thousands that you know fifty microns below fifty microns. All of that's possible, but to do it economically, the decorticator again was the bottleneck. Getting the the herd as clean as possible with as little fiber on it as possible is what allows all these other finishing techniques to, to be, uh, allow the herd to get ground down to these products. So we've, we've got, you know, 20 thousandths of an inch sized powder that you can blend into plastics. 
Now, is it completely 100% hemp plastic? No, but it's a start. I mean, progress is progress. If we can blend 2% or 3% or 5% in, and it, it's a source reduction. We take some weight of plastic out of it. It's not ideal, but it's a good start. Um, we've got some people looking at, you know, isolating some of the hydrocarbons out of the herd because it's been ground so fine and it's so clean. Now it allows them to do some of this work in actual degradable plastics because we, our technique is to let it get that clean. So, you know, some of that's genetics, but the technique of cleaning the herd away from the fiber is allowing all of these other things to start to get a little more traction and, and speed because we've gotten it so clean that it's just really enhanced and optimized the performance of these other pieces of equipment. That's so cool. we didn't even realize until what, six months ago, seven months ago, how important that was. Because, I mean, I, like I said, I came out of plastics and had searched for years for a degradable plastic. Never found anything that I thought we could stamp our name on and say, yes, it's degradable without industrial heat, water, and temperature, right? In the true sense of the word, degrading plastics is, is carbon and hydrogen, and it goes back into the, into, the, into the earth. But nothing like that existed that I personally have seen. So I think I'm kind of excited to see what um, some of the fruits of that work and that research yields us in the very short term. I'm, I'm kind of excited. Yeah, I imagine lots of other people are going to be excited about that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this, this machine back there, um, let's say, like, how, how does it scale up? Like, would you need several of these if you had well, a, a lot of input, or would you just build a bigger machine? <clears throat> Scaling machinery to size is not all the, always the right way. I, I'm there's, there's times that that fits and times it doesn't. I'm also personally a big fan of redundancy. So instead of having one giant machine that does this, that might do it really, really well, I'd rather have five, ten smaller machines so that if one breaks down, you know, if I've got ten of them, I only lost ten percent of my capacity. If I've got one giant machine and one piece of that goes down, I'm I'm at zero. So there's something to be said for redundancy and capacity and then uh, availability to customize or run different orders for different customers on different pieces of machinery at the same time you know let's say you've got a larger customer you can run two machines filling their product and then you've got smaller people maybe they only need off of one line and another person gets you know you run campaigns and you run four lines for a month and then stop and go to somebody else's there's something to be said about having that flexibility to run multiple products at once and try to cover more uh, customer base at one time. So I kind of like the idea of the redundancy more so than bigger scale. Okay. I, do, you know, I don't think people understand what you know two tons an hour of hemp fiber and herd looks like coming out of a machine. It's an enormous amount of material. Yeah. It really is. I mean, you're talking two to three to four bales an hour going into that piece of equipment and feeding that is more challenging than you think. Taking it away once it's been converted and it's fluffy is even worse. You know, you're taking something that weighs a few pounds of per, per cubic foot and making it weigh one pound per cubic foot. Or, you know, in the case of herd, maybe it's a little denser, but the bulk and the volume is really impressive uh, once you start looking at it. Yeah. So when we see videos of stuff running, it, it, it there's a lot of a lot of knowledge yet to be gained on what true throughput is. One of the things that Corbett touched on there was through the redundancy, being able to fill different orders for different people. And those different orders might be different sizes of herd, right. for instance. If you take some of the other possible possibilities on the market for decortication, you get what they put out. That's it. We have the ability to provide what the customers need. And I think that's a big plus in, for, in what we have to offer for our customers. Great. Um, what else should, you know, potential customers be, what, what should they know about Formation Ag? What, what other information can you share? No, I mean, the big one is, is we really completely and totally 100% believe that the farms have to be successful. And we've done an enormous amount of work in design and machinery, but we've also done, I mean, when I go around the country and speak to people, Pretty much all they ask for is, hey, come do that presentation you did on gross return per acre. I want to know the real story of what I can get off of an acre of hemp grown, and we compare it to corn, wheat, soy, you know, so that you can make an informed business decision of, hey, do I want to put in these acres? 
Um, you know, we talked about everything starts with a sale and work backwards. I, I say that all the time and people are get sick of it. But if you don't think with the end in mind and work your way backwards, you're going to have a hiccup somewhere in there that causes you financial trouble, uh, machinery trouble, something, name it. There can be a possible scenario where you have an issue if, you know, you buy a machine and then what? You know, where are you going to sell these products? So, you know, we put together people to help with offtake. You know, we were developing some of these products at this other company to help create demand for the product and create a pull system so that when, when, when a customer puts a machine in, you know, let them know that, hey, we're here to help you sell some of this stuff. You may not need us for all of it, but if you buy a machine with X capacity and you only have demand for half of it, you know, we, we we're going to have products that were in the works in the pipeline here to help consume that so that you can be efficient and make some money at your operation. Because we everybody's got to be successful. We really need this to help yep. uh, drive the industry forward. We don't need the I call it the CBD black guy. You know, we we don't need a hundred thousand acres of fiber next year because there's re, may or may not be enough demand for it. And and we still don't understand the genetics and how they're going to perform ultimately in these finished goods. So like the, <clears throat> with with our other company. We're doing varietal trials around the country. To the best of my knowledge, it's the largest variety trial in different locations and everything from you know the northern part of the country all the way down to Puerto Rico because we just don't know how these things are going to perform. What's the name of that company? Uh, Global Fiber and our Tanja partners. It's, it's a group we put together to help drive this, this uh, knowledge base forward because we just don't know what we don't know right. so we've got nine varieties in 17 different locations some with universities some are, deep, some are private but we've got them in different areas multiple different planting dates so we can see okay how late could we plant this crop what's the what's the yield what's the germination you know what 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 is all of these things we just flat out don't know yet and then tie that to those pieces will come back here those those stocks will come back we'll break them down and send them off and see what the performance characteristics are of that product so we can really determine okay are we on the right track maybe this cultivar is great and this one looks great on paper but in practicality it can't perform but for only these kind of products mm. or you know maybe it has the best tinsel okay this is we're gonna start making anchor ropes again i don't know why but maybe somebody wants an anchor rope and they need the ultimate tinsel strength mm. stupid scenario but you know what if right. we, there's things we just flat out don't understand yeah. yet so um a minute ago you mentioned a presentation that you give that people want you to give again mm -hmm. what talk about that a little it, bit it's you know the economics of of farming this crop um that was one of the the downfalls in cbd is people heard well you can make a million dollars an acre so three years ago i think maybe four i can't remember now i started putting together true economics of gross return per acre for farm and i kind of stopped i've taken a little further than gross revenue um, and started subtracting some of the input costs because you know i just don't know where everybody's inputs are but at today's prices what, what's herd selling for what fiber sells for what the grain sells for paint a picture where if you're just a grain farmer here's the potential revenue at an average yield a very conservative average yield if, if you want to grow true fiber crop, you know, for textiles, where you harvest before it goes to flower, right? That's the conventional wisdom. We don't even know that for sure. But I think they're, you know, the Chinese have been doing it for a long time. I'm pretty sure they're right. So if you stop at that stage pre-flower, what's your revenue per acre based on tonnage, right? And then what happens if, if you're going to dual crop, like the, the bales you see outside, that was a dual crop grain fiber crop that we're breaking down. So what is the economics of, I took X number of pounds of, of seed and X tons of fiber off of there. So what's the combined revenue? So I do those revenue kind of model things, just trying to give people a realistic scenario of what this could look like financially and how it impacts their farm compared to their corn crops or wheat crops or whatever it is. And at this point, is it economically viable? $7 corn's pushing it, it's, it's close. Um, six dollar corn it, it's even or a little bit better three and a half four dollar corn is definitely better it's still better than wheat right now especially dry land wheat um barley same thing it's still more economically feasible than barley so it is it is a crop especially like this area here you are in the, in the san Luis valley 
um, we have a, a water issue. Um, everything's in an aquifer and people were pumping to grow potatoes. So potatoes take 32, 36 on average inches of water a year to grow a crop. The hemp here, and this is a high mountain desert, somewhere between 12 and I mean, you could call it 15, 16. Wow. Depends on how hot it is and how many rain events we get, etc. Point being is it's a substantial water savings. Yeah. So if you're a, you know, and, the, and we've got dry land plots out. So if you're a dry land farm and maybe you're more west and you don't get all those good rain events, well, maybe you can get away with this genetic because it still could have the potential to perform with a little less risk than maybe crop that, a corn crop that's going to bloom and curl. You know, those are things we still are trying to learn, but we took those steps and put the rubber to the road and put the ground, the seed in the ground, and we're learning those things. So from a water perspective, that's huge yeah. in this area. Right. And then they're finding some other benefits that were totally unknown, like a nematode suppression. Um, doesn't matter to a whole lot of people, but if you're table stock potatoes, nematodes in your potato crop is a damage and it's a, it's a, a, a visual defect, and so it's a negative. This, this is somehow pushing nematodes out of the fields. So, so you it, would you would get hemp in your potato rotation? Like you would yeah. grow hemp oh, yeah. after potatoes? It, that's what's happening here. Okay. Is the hemp is going in, I think, mostly before potatoes, and then they'll follow it with it. Even on organic, you have to cultivate a little more, uh, being that there's not chemicals to knock that hemp back. But even if you get a, a hemp plant in the middle of potatoes, when you go through and the vines die down, uh, the hemp plant just goes out the diviner chains and it's really not an issue. Right. So it could be if it wraps, but you know, if yeah. this stuff can wrap, it'll wrap and it makes a mess. But um, yeah, driving in here today, we saw all those pivots with potatoes. Yeah, this you is know, huge potato flowering crop. now. Yeah. Yeah, they're all in the flowering stage right now. Uh, they lost a whole pile of them last week to hail. To hail. Twelve thousand acres. Oh, no kidding. Yep. That's a bummer. We'll see how many of them come back. We drove through some hail coming here today. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a thing. Yeah. Hmm. Well, um, I appreciate you having me out here today. Is there anything else you want to share with our audience or forget, get, Randy. get your message out there? You know, the only thing that I could think of that we might want to mention is that there are so many variables in input quality of product going yeah. into the decorticator. And that can be in terms of genetic or in terms of the way it was redded or farmed or weed. even baled. Sometimes they're, they're baled... Um, too tight or even too loose, and that makes it difficult to, to run through the decorticator in a consistent fashion. Um, and Corbett mentioned moisture content. It's extremely important as far as what we do. Yeah. There are a lot of things like that that people need to keep in mind that they don't just go out and do it in some typical fashion that they maybe run hay or something like that. They right. need to get some advice on how to do some of those things ahead of time. Do you offer some kind of like best practices, you know, literature or something that you, you can share you with know, farmers? We, we don't really have literature or anything like yeah. that but we do an awful lot of hemp 101 conversations right. on, on the telephone right and anybody that calls us for information like that we're happy to help them because if they're not a, a customer right now they will be down the road somewhere yep we don't mind those conversations all right but we are trying to at some point in time we'll have some farming practice things yeah. you know we I really need a consultant to, word but do you have an yeah. agronomist on staff uh not here one of the other companies we've got some agronomy kind of people but okay just, I, I'm a plant pathologist by training and, and raised a whole pile of different crops. So, um, you know, it's just, we're just an old farmer trying to build stuff. So right. we, we kind of, <laughs> we went, we want people to succeed. So it's worth it, you know, talking about, uh, you know, plant it a little tighter. Look how you do your seed bed preparation to help uh, let the crop canopy soon so you don't have weed pressure because pigweed and hemp look really similar when they're dry. <laughs> But boy, they sure don't process the same, <laughs> and it makes a mess. So you know those kind of farming practices, cultural practices, are really going to be uh, key for for people if we're going to keep moving this former or forward to to understand how uh, how those practices are going to yield dividends downstream in the processing uh, lifespan of the crop. All right. Um, step into the time machine with me. Let's go ten years into the future. What's the hemp industry looking like in the U.S.? Oh boy. Wow. Even a year in the future is tough to, <laughs> yeah. to figure out right now. No, I'll see, I would see a lot more fiber uses. Right now, everybody's looking at the herd because it's, it's the, the low-hanging fruit, as you say. 
you know, cordage things, more textiles, uh, blending hemp in. I don't think it's going to suppress cotton immediately. In, and I don't know if we would want to. Um, you know, all, all your textile machines at the moment are made for these, you know, short staple cotton, mm -hmm. a couple different varieties of cotton. You start throwing in these longer line stuff, there's a lot of work to do there. But it should be, you know, there should be a lot more products that are containing hemp on the market, uh, whether it's shirts or clothes or, like I said, cordage stuff. I don't know what it'll be. but And then to me, the big one is in 10 years, I don't see why there's not a degradable plastic of some sort. You know, you get a, get a product that we can drop into plastic infrastructure, meaning a resin pellet that we can put into an extruder. That changes the landscape of everything you touch in the in the country right now. Whether, you know, there's plastic in everything we do every yep. day. Yep. Whether you're driving it, sitting on it, wearing it, doesn't matter. There's plastic somewhere, and you know, it's a lot of times maybe it's necessary evil, but if we can make that degradable, and either either more recyclable or completely degradable, that changes a lot of stuff. Yeah, that for I'm sure. excited for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because to to get away from you know petroleum we would change things like geopolitically environmentally you know uh, it'd be mm -hmm. pretty amazing to have a yep. world where it's not all based on right on oil but a lot of that's going to come you know the, we talked about cbd and how it's kind of at this level education awareness understanding that the hemp is is not the psychedelic you know thc high high burdens or high levels um that educational awareness is going to help grain consumption. You know, either dehulled or protein powder or whatever it is, that consumption and that awareness, the more that goes up, the more we're going to help the farms and the more this is becoming a more mainstream crop, the, the faster we're going to be able to do these things. Um, you know, like the supporting the Hemp Feed Coalition. There's no reason for this crop not to be usable for animal feed. Right. And the, the, the people that are doing some of this work on the side, it's fascinating, the benefits to the animal health. And that's that's a huge portion of this. Another step towards making all this progress faster. Yeah. Right? And it's crazy, like, you can feed hemp seeds to your children, but not to your, your animals. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it makes no sense. Yeah. Um, so, right. Well, and you uh, can actually feed them to your animals as long as you don't eat them or right. sell them. Yeah. So, yeah. I think not to take anything at all away from biodegradable plastic, but I think I'm most excited about, you know, you know, there are a lot of very, very intelligent people in this world and in this country with a lot of great ideas. And some of the things like graphene and 3D printing are only scratching the surface of what may be capable with this plant as we start working on it and, and uh, developing some of the ideas that are, we're capable of doing with that. All right. Cool. You mentioned the whole uh, sort of marijuana stigma and I, I find that just is, it's just so distracting to the actual work that needs to be done yeah. in the hemp industry. I mean, the farm bill got it right. This is a commodity. And I was showing your family, opened up a bag of our long line fiber. I said, smell it, touch it. It's just straw. Yeah. That's all this really is. Really strong straw. It's just straw. Um, there's no reason for the, for this crop to be regulated. I, I, you know, we, we try to get our congressional people in and our senators in and, as, as much as we possibly can and when we get their ear we tell them you know this is just another commodity crop no large scale farm viable farm would ever risk their land their equipment their livelihood their family to grow a couple hot plants with intent right that just doesn't make any sense this truly should have always been a commodity uh and and the farm bill started that and then you know the connotation that yeah somebody's going to try to grow a hot crop out it just it, it, nine times out of ten if they grew a hot crop it's because their genetic selection or what they were given right it's not because they said yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna get 0.31 i'm gonna make an extra million <laughs> that wasn't the intent of this and i think it's a little misguided when they keep trying to regulate all these things and and it really is hurting the progress of this of this crop yeah because it truly is just another dang commodity let's yeah. farm this stuff and get to work yeah exactly you know, we put our heads down and just work here. Get it it doesn't. Yeah. The rest of it is is not really all that important to us. We just want to keep this thing going and progressing because it's a fascinating plant, and and the things that we can do for the good of the of the 
ag, ag in, in in our population and the planet in general are just those benefits way outweigh the the THC component of this thing. Amen to that. Corbett Hefner, Randy, Randy Wright. Wright. Got her. <laughs> now we got it. <laughs> uh, appreciate you having me down here today. Well, thank you uh, for it's coming. Well worth the journey. We were really excited to have you. Yeah. Good. I'm excited to be here. So thank you. Thank you. So yeah, the guys at Formation Ag, a great bunch of guys. Um, they they brought my whole family in, and you know while I was doing the interview, my family was all set up. They had you know stuff to drink and the air conditioning and watching movies on their computers. It was uh, a lot nicer for them than being stuck in the RV when I'm when I was in the shop. Uh, but in further conversations with Corbett, um, he thought of something that he he wished he had said during our interview. So I, I uh, recorded that, and I want to share that with you. For the first time, hemp, hemp is giving farmers the opportunity to control, do the value-added work to help control their financial destiny. It's the first time they're, they're not stuck with a granary kind of model where they, they take it to an elevator and they get whatever the commodity is trading for. I think if we do this correctly, they're going to be able to set some price points and control that financial fu- future from top to bottom on this uh, commodity or this this crop I think is really exciting that the availability the option the choice they have to make if they want to participate in this and do these extra steps this extra work is going to let them control the value that's really exciting from Monta Vista we got on US Highway 160 uh, that's the road that goes up through the San Juan Mountains we were on our way to to Mesa Verde and we went up through what's called Wolf Creek Pass, which was really uh, quite a fun, uh, but rather harrowing uh, trip through the mountains. Man, everything is different when you're driving a 30-foot RV. It's, it's just crazy. Uh, I think if I were to do this trip again, I would definitely not bring a 30-foot RV. It's a little more uh, RV than I need. But, you know, it's an interesting way to view the world from behind the steering wheel of uh, this behemoth. Anyway, so we survived Wolf Creek's pass, and uh, both Corbett and Randy were like, whatever you do, go super slow. You know, you'll only come down on that pass fast once. I'm not sure what they meant by that, but we took their advice and we drove super slow. Elderly slow, as my wife likes to say. So, uh, yeah, we we camped near Mesa Verde uh, that night. And we got up and we, we went to the, um, you know, the site of the ancient Pueblo people and we saw the, the, saw the cliff dwellings. And uh, yeah, from there we, we got on 191 and headed north um, into Utah. Um, and 191 through Utah is now one of my favorite roads in America. Oh my God, so just absolutely beautiful. So different from the back roads of Pennsylvania. Uh, but wow, um, I loved it there. So we got to Moab. We were camping at the KOA in Moab. And right when we got there, this, this crazy storm whipped up. You know, we had tumbleweeds flying at us. There was hail. There was lightning. It, there was like 70 mile an hour winds. So it was a little freaky as we rode into Moab. But the next day was gorgeous. Um, we, we spent some time there. Uh, and then after Moab, we, we sort of made a beeline up to the Northern California coast. We had a very long driving day. Uh, we had several long driving days. You know, we got up first to eastern Nevada, and then from there we, we went uh, into California. And it was a, a much longer trip because we, we chose a route that avoided some of the big fires. You know, we could see the smoke on the horizon, but we did not, you know, for example, take 395 because that went right through where the fires are most active. So, wow, it's challenging to, to go on a trip like this when uh, the West is on fire. But we made it to Northern California. Um, we have some friends up here in the town of Fieldbrook. And, uh, yeah, they're treating us real nice up here. And um, soon we're heading up to Oregon and then eventually to Washington. And then we're going to start our journey back east. We're going to head out to um, Fort Benton, Montana and hang out with the folks at IND Hemp. So I'm looking forward to that. And you can always get in touch with me. You can send me a, an email. To send it to podcast at lancasterfarming.com. 
I always love hearing from listeners. You know, you have ideas, you have questions, you just want to shoot the shit, then drop me a line. I don't really like hearing from drivers who have a problem with how we drive our 30-foot RV over mountain passes in rural California. But yeah, some dude called up our main office to complain about how we were, we were driving too slow. But, you know, it's a 30-foot RV, and we're just trying to keep it, you know, on the road. So, whatever, buddy. You guys have a, a motor home driving through rural California and Trinity County right now. It's Sunday. It's about 10 o'clock. Uh, you guys have a motor home driving through rural California and Trinity County and uh, they're driving like idiots and they're making your whole operation look real bad. Normally I'd be very interested in an industrial hemp podcast, but I just watched this dumbass driving less than half the speed limit almost have to drive off the road. You know, whoever is operating that vehicle, you should get a hold of them and let them know to obey the rules of the road for the state they're in so that you guys don't lose potential uh, viewership, readership, the whole nine yards. I'm highly disappointed. Yeah, so I disappointed this guy. But, you know, uh, here's a guy who, while also driving these uh, rural mountain treacherous roads, takes the time to, I assume, Google the phone number for Lancaster Farming and then call up and leave this snarky message. Maybe, maybe he should have just kept his eyes on the road himself because he's clearly putting people in danger too. But also, um, if you see a 30-foot RV sort of, you know, going slow on the mountain passes, give them some room because it's difficult to drive a 30-foot RV up and down these mountains, okay? So sorry to disappoint you, buddy, but whatever. Um, I, I have a feeling that the rest of the people in California are decent human beings and aren't the type of people to call up, you know, the main office when they see a motorhome that they don't like. But anyway, um, thank you, California. It's been a wonderful visit here. And uh, yeah, so my name is Eric Harlock. I am the digital editor at Lancaster Farming Newspaper, and I've been on the road now for 19 or 20 days and uh, starting to get a little homesick. Um, yeah, but, you know, we've got miles to go ahead of us, and I'm really looking forward to seeing everybody in, in Montana and Nebraska and, uh, yeah, Newcastle, Pennsylvania there at the very end. So, okay, stay tuned, and uh, yeah, be sure to drop me a line. And you can also leave me a message, too, because, you know, sometimes I do like to publish people's voices. You can leave me a message at 717-721-4462. All right, thank you for listening. Until next time, I'll see you on the road. Industrial hemp. Oh, wait, one more thing. This is sort of a, a postscript. Just want to give a shout out to my friends over there at Wild Fox Provisions. They hooked me up with some CBD products that uh, I have been finding very, very therapeutic um, for some body pain as I'm, I'm driving a whole lot in this thing. And uh, yeah, it's nice. So thank you, Ben and Carl. This episode of the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast is copyright 2021 by Lancaster Farming Newspaper, part of the Steinman Communications family. Today's show was written and recorded, edited and produced by Eric Herlock, and any music you hear throughout the show is courtesy of Tin Bird Shadow. Thank you.